All right. Uh, so it's the last session of the day, so I'll try to keep it pretty light. Um, so basically, what I'm going to be talking about today is this paper that I've been working on with uh, Daisy Day, Weija, uh, Ginger Jin, and Jung Min Lee. And what we've been thinking about is a really practical question that uh, arose from some of the work that I've been doing in a series of projects uh, about online review type platforms. So you could think about Yelp or TripAdvisor or Angie's List. Uh, so let me just start by giving a little bit of motivation for how I started thinking about these issues. Uh, something that's happened over the last decade is we've seen this proliferation of new types of information sources. So you can think about Yelp, so Angie's List, TripAdvisor, Dion, Ping, but also reviews are kind of proliferating through online marketplaces. Uh, you can think about Amazon, eBay, ZocDoc. And in fact, it's hard to think about a purchase that you make or a product that you see that doesn't have online reviews give, providing information about it. All of these are part of the crowdsourcing movement, so meaning that uh, these reviews are provided by people who aren't paid, simply uh, typically will register an email address and leave some sort of uh, rating and possibly some text with it. Which means that there's a whole new issues that come up with this that is a little bit different from the types of biases and problems that we see uh, in the types of media that we've been mostly talking about for the last two days. Uh, just to give an idea of how quickly things are changing, here are just some search, generic search trends uh, for the term Yelp versus Michelin Guide over time. So you could just see that uh, it's been a pretty rapid shift in recent years uh, toward looking for uh, crowdsourced information versus more traditional types of media. Uh, you see something similar if you look at Angie's List. A uh, spike is when they IPO'd, and then it went back down suspiciously afterwards. But, uh, and the reason that I started thinking about this is actually uh, these reviews really matter. So I had some earlier work uh, estimating causal impact of Yelp ratings on restaurant sales, where I had merged a bunch of restaurants' data uh, for a six-year span in the city of Seattle and implemented a regression discontinuity design to see uh, what the effect of a Yelp rating is. And you see that uh, one star increase leads to about a 5% increase in restaurant sales. Yeah for independent restaurants and no real impact for chain restaurants. Uh, similar types of findings have been shown in online marketplaces. So uh, Judy Chevalier and Dina Maislin had a paper in 2006 looking at uh, online sales of books and showed that places that books that were doing well on Barnes & Noble started selling more uh, when they got good ratings on Barnes & Noble relative to books on Amazon. You see similar things for eBay reviews and prices, uh, TripAdvisor and hotel reservations, and ZocDoc and Dr. Choice. Basically, across all of these, you see that uh, these are becoming one of the primary drivers of success for a business. And in fact, if you think about a 5% in increase in sales for a restaurant, this is uh, frequently enough to make a business either stay in business or go out of business. Uh, another thing, another stylized fact about reviews that is interesting to me at least is the fact that there's such wide coverage. So this is one of the big advantages of an um, of uh, crowdsourced information versus other types of information. So this is from Seattle. Uh, this is end of 2009, and actually the percent of restaurants that are on Yelp has increased since then. So now it's closer to 85 percent. Uh, and what you can see is that at the end of this sample, roughly 70 percent of restaurants in Seattle were on Yelp, and that's compared to, say, about 5% that were in Zagat, uh, less than 5% that were in Seattle Times, and if you're a real foodie and read Food and Wine, uh, it's about 1% of restaurants were on there. So it's a type of marketplace where uh, one of the big benefits is that there's a lot of coverage of products. So especially in markets like restaurants where there are so many products, this is an important source of information. Uh, but when we think about this, there's also a lot of things that we don't really know about the information that's being generated on online review platforms. Uh, they're relatively anonymous, so you could think about something where somebody may have some sort of a reputation, but certainly uh, Roger Ebert is better known than any single reviewer uh, who is a consumer on Rotten Tomatoes. They're difficult to verify, so there are a bunch of spam detection algorithms that people use to try to say, is this review fake or is that review real? But at the end of the day, it's still really hard to know which of these are legitimate. There's extremely low barriers to reviewing, so you don't have to take any sort of a test to kind of become a reviewer on there in contrast with somebody who wants to be a critic for the New York Times. And there are a bunch of problems that people have started to estimate empirically that are going on here. 
And some of the main things that people see when looking at their review space is, uh, are reviews representative? So a lot of people have started to estimate that, well, uh, the underlying population doesn't necessarily look like the population of reviewers. So for example, Lee and Hit had uh, gone through all the Amazon reviews and essentially looked product by product and showed that bunches of products and types of products had uh, reviews that looked more bimodal. So lots of one stars and five stars rather than uh, something that may represent, say, a normal distribution of preferences. Uh, Wang had looked at the idea of social image and showed that on sites that have people post lots of pictures, you tend to have more normal looking distributions of reviews than other sites. Uh, the second issue that's come up in the literature is this idea of are reviews authentic? So uh, Judy Chevalier uh, and Dover and Maislin had a paper last year uh, that, that looked at fake reviews on TripAdvisor. Uh, and I have some work with my co-author, Yorgos Zervis, where we had looked at Yelp fake reviews and looked at the conditions under which there are a lot of fake reviews. Uh, our estimate is that at least reviews that Yelp has identified as fake uh, constitute basically 20% of reviews that get submitted to Yelp uh, and are most likely in situations where the economic incentives to leave a fake review are strongest. So you can think about uh, a firm that has had a bad hit to its reputation or an independent restaurant versus a chain restaurant. And finally, another issue that's been raised is peer effects in information provision. So essentially what we see is that uh, people have looked at comment sections of blogs and say that uh, when somebody leaves a positive comment, then there tends to be a cascade of positive comments that follow after that. So there's some thought that there's hurting in the types of information that are uh, coming through in crowdsourced information, which means that if you were thinking about uh, how much to trust the second piece of information, you would want to take into account what the first person had said. So the types of questions I've been thinking about for the past year, year and a half, are really kind of a little bit uh, away from some of my earlier stuff where I was thinking about how much does information matter, but more about how should we design information. So working both with academics and practitioners, thinking about what's the right way to display information to people, conditional on some of the things we know about how information is being generated. Uh, and there are two parts of this type of agenda, which is half, uh, how should information be collected? So I've been working with, for example, uh, a series of cities where we go through and try to think about using crowdsourced information to learn about where there's going to be a hygiene violation in a restaurant. Uh, and there you could use NLP type methods to say, all right, well, we know exactly where there's going to be a violation. And now we have uh, restaurant inspectors who could be reallocated based on that. Uh, uh, second type of issue here, uh, which is closer to what I'll be talking about today, is how should information be presented? So uh, once you have information that you want to give to people, whether it's a disclosure policy or whether you're a third party ranking group or uh, rating agency or crowdsource review platform, uh, you have a bunch of decisions about where this information should be, what's the right channel, and how you should aggregate it. The thing that I want to talk about for the rest of today uh, is a really simple question, which is thinking about online review platforms like Yelp and thinking about their role as an information aggregator. Uh, so it turns out that any given restaurant on Yelp may not just have one review, like reading a New York Times review, but they may have 500 reviews. Maybe the average restaurant has 30 reviews, and there's some distribution around this with a long tail. Uh, even with just 30 reviews, it's not clear that anybody is going through and reading every single review that's on there. Uh, they actually, and based on some of the evidence that we've seen in other papers, uh, people pay attention to this average rating. So people's response to information is pretty coarse. So the question that I was thinking about in this paper is what's the metric that you want to present to people? So how do you want to be aggregating information in a way that's going to make it as efficient as possible? And you know, we could talk about what the definition of having kind of good information or efficient information might be. Uh, essentially, just to have something in the back of your head, what we think about in this paper is something that's our best guess of what the true quality, uh, true average vertical quality is of a product uh, with the lowest variance possible. All right, so uh, let, let me just give a few examples. I have three examples of where this aggregation problem comes up in online review platforms. And each of these platforms deals with it slightly differently. And maybe this will help to give a little structure around uh, how I've been thinking about it. And I'd also be curious to hear how other people are thinking about this or what some other considerations might be. Uh, so this is Lou Malnati's Pizzeria. Um, probably people who work here may have been there before. Uh, other people may have been there 
two. It's pretty good. Uh, and what what we see here is that uh, there are four stars, and the four stars are based on 1,430 reviews. Clearly, uh, nobody has read all 1,430 of these reviews before deciding, or at least hopefully nobody has read all 1,430 of these reviews before deciding. Uh, but Yelp has kind of made this executive decision to say, well, um, the average rating is important. The number of reviews are important. That's what we're going to put front and center next to every business. And we're going to weight these reviews arithmetically. So just uh, one five star and one one star uh, is going to be a three star rating. There's a second manifestation of it. So uh, X-Men Days of Future Past, uh, embarrassingly the last movie I saw. And um, you know, like the, huh? good. it's a good movie. It's a 90, 91%. Um, you know, I don't know if we look at the selection of underlying reviewers, if we still think it's a great movie. Uh, but basically, what we see here uh, is they've made a couple of decisions here. So they said, well, obviously, uh, the number of people who like the movie is something that's important. And when we think about what it means to like the movie here, what they do is break everything into rotten and fresh. So when they say 91%, they mean that 91% of people have rated this uh, six, six stars or above out of 10. And they aggregate that, and then they give that information to everybody. And you'll see that they did something else here, which is they said they've got all critics, or you could look at top critics. So top critics would be Roger Deber types and people who are working for major media publications, and all critics would include uh, any one of us who went on and left a review on there. Um, or at least if you have a blog, that kind of seems uh, somewhat legitimate. So there are a lot of people here that they would say, you're a critic, but you shouldn't get quite the same weight as everybody else. Uh, so if you kind of think that there are some people who have more information than others, or maybe more precise information about product quality, then you would want to hit this tab that says uh, top critics, and you'll see another thing that's like 85%. Uh, but again, the kind of key features here are that they have this information that's very coarse, and they think kind of about, oh, different people may have some sort of different information structure. So just a quick third example of this uh, that I think gets at another feature of how you might want to weight things differently if you're looking at an online review platform. Uh, this is from Angie's List. So what Angie's List does is they say, well, fine, maybe there are some people that know more than others, so uh, kind of an elite user or kind of a professional critic or somebody who we think is pretty good. But they say that there's also another feature that's important which is uh, whether something is new or old. So there are reviews in the past that may no longer be representative of the quality of a product. And this is straight from their website. They say, while viewing companies' grades on their profile, you'll notice the member reviews are organized into two columns. Recent column shows the average grade a provider has earned over the past three years. Uh, the all column averages all the grades a service provider has received across all service categories. Uh, so they decide to use three-year window based on the based on surveying people and kind of looking at a time frame that seems to be the most representative. So implicitly, they're kind of acknowledging that there's some sort of a dynamic process in the generation of this content that you may want to take into account differently. So what I wanted to think about in this paper is how should platforms aggregate and present these ratings? Uh, it's something that these companies and bunches of other companies have thought about and seems like something that we may be able to use some sort of econometric tools or economic theory to start to say something about. So how should this information be aggregated? Well, uh, one thing you could do is just say present all the details. You could have distributions, you could have variants, you could just say, well, look, I'm gonna give people all the information. And in fact, kind of I think one mistake that a lot of uh, public information providers do is just to provide all the information and say, oh, let, let people go through all of this themselves. People are pretty sophisticated. Um, but the reality is, based on the empirical evidence, that people are pretty inattentive when they're paying attention to decisions. Uh, so Devin Pope has some great work on this. Uh, so I have some work on this. A uh, bunch of people have things that basically say that if you aggregate stuff, people are going to be more responsive to it than if you leave it disaggregated and have the exact same informational content in it. Uh, we also know, as I just mentioned, that aggregate ratings have a direct influence on decision making. So now taking a step back from this, the, the mean seems to be one starting point for where you might think about this problem. Although you might also want to think about what do you show in terms of distributions or other types of summary statistics. Uh, so the thing we're thinking about, is the arithmetic mean really the optimal? 
And it seems like it's pretty restrictive, actually, to think that there's a condition, the conditions under which this would be the right way to display information to people. Uh, so you might think it's optimal, for example, if you think that you know, quality is fixed, it never changes, reviews are unbiased, everything is independent and identically distributed around some mean. Then it seems like it's just law of large numbers, and you just kind of weight everything equally, and eventually you'll converge to what the true quality is. Uh, so in this paper, then what we do is we say, well, how can we get to something that looks closer to what an optimal aggregate rating might be? Uh, so we develop a model of the data generating process, and we think about some things like uh, what are the reviewer attributes? So we think about the number of reviews somebody has, uh, and we also think about, and we focus heavily on elite status, and I'll talk in a second about what that means. Uh, we, we allow reviewers to have different precision on their reviews, we, which basically means we have some people we think are uh, good guessers at what the long run quality or what kind of this is eventually going to converge to. And we have some people who are just bad guessers of what this is eventually going to converge to. Uh, we also allow people to have the incentive to herd. So people who think, oh, well, I don't necessarily want to uh, just say my signal, but I want to aggregate this and come up with what I think the best guess of quality may be conditional on what everybody else has said before me. Um, and we do some stuff with a restaurant reviewer uh, match to see oh, if I like French food and you like Italian food, then you could differentiate between a situation where I rate an Italian restaurant uh, badly because it's a bad restaurant or because it's just a bad match for me. And finally, we have some uh, we allow for some degree of quality change uh, following kind of a specific structure, although admittedly you could do a lot more, I think, than we're currently doing with this. And then what we wanted to do is basically make the point that once you use, once you have all the stuff, you could just start to adjust everything and reweight ratings to create what, whatever your definition of kind of an optimally aggregated rating would be. So you could say, all right, well, so we know exactly what this data generating process was. We can invert everything and then say, all right, well, this is really a four-star restaurant. And then you could take all of the ratings that you see on any given marketplace and say, all right, well, here's what the true distribution is and see how does that compare to what a simple average might be. Um, and again, for our purposes, all we're saying is that what we're thinking about optimal as being unbiased vertical quality estimate and as precise as possible. Uh, just to give an idea of where the results are going with this, uh, there's a bunch of stuff in the paper, uh, but the main things that we're thinking about are uh, social concerns. So this idea that some people might be hurting and some people might be hurting more than other people in ways that are consistent with the way the platform is designed, uh, and just this heterogeneity and accuracy. So we see that aggregation is going to matter a lot. Uh, there are going to be major shifts in the whole distribution of reviews once you start to allow for things to be aggregated in different ways. And uh, restaurant quality change, even if you allow for very simple things like a random walk over time, you start to see that this dramatically changes the interpretation of what uh, any given path of reviews might be. And uh, one result that we're struggling with, that, we're, that there's like different ways to interpret and we're struggling with picking what the right one might be, uh, is a chilling effect. So just a stylized fact that's starting to emerge about online reviews is that there's a dynamic path such that ratings tend to get worse over time for products. Um, and part of this you might think is just, oh, people are burning reputation, but it doesn't feel like it's just that. And then uh, we have this, ver this uh, concept of stringency where we think about just some people are uh, just leave better ratings for everything and other people just leave worse ratings for everything. So uh, you could just think about, you know, Jesse's a Debbie Downer and Matt's a pretty happy-go-lucky guy, so he's going to leave four stars and you're going to leave two stars for everything you get. And clearly, this is something that you might want to kind of start to take out of the data if you start to think, well, how should we be aggregating this? Uh, so then in terms of optimal aggregation, we adjust the individual ratings based on stringency, uh, based on the match quality. And then we also, the second thing we do is we adjust the weights that we give to everything. Uh, we give, uh, so we endogenously give more weight to recent reviews, kind of allowing for this type of quality change over time. And we also uh, adjust weights based on the quality of reviewers. And the primary way that we do this is, again, looking at the elite versus non-elite reviewers. And we say, well, you guys are uh, more erratic than you, so uh, we could reduce the noise in the final estimate by giving weights to the people who have the best signals of quality. And then we have these two versions of accounting for a uh, chilling effect. Uh, okay, so now a little bit about Yelp, just to give a little bit of background about that type of context. So for people who don't know Yelp, Yelp is a restaurant review website, and they review bunches of other stuff too, like they review barbershops or uh, boutiques. 
and they get 132 million unique visitors per month, and they have a total of 57 million reviews. Uh, and the way that they make money is they sell ads, and the ads will show up at the top of a search page. So uh, just to give an idea of what gets reviewed, we're going to be looking at restaurants, but they, here's just the distribution that I just pulled from Yelp about what their distribution of businesses on there. So 23% of businesses on Yelp are shopping places, although the distribution of reviews is skewed a lot more toward restaurants, which is why we ended up choosing restaurants as a setting to work with. Uh, and again, uh, anyone could leave a review for any restaurant, and there's no pay for anybody who's a reviewer. Uh, the readers essentially will see this overall rating, the number of reviews, uh, be able to read through the details of the reviews, and also see these horizontal attributes of a restaurant. Well, you can see the restaurant location, uh, what cuisine it is, and there's no cost to read. Uh, listings are all free, so every business essentially either gets up there automatically, and uh, now they have it so that you could just submit businesses that seem like they're missing from there. Uh, here's just, again, uh, search for it. So if you look for a deep dish pizza, uh, here's what you'll see. The first thing you'll see is it, it'll be sorted for you, and Lou Malnati is a pick for just because this was uh, listed first year. Uh, you could limit by neighborhood, pick the distance, uh, look at the price category. So uh, to the extent that you think that there's some horizontal and some vertical dimension of this, a lot of the horizontal pieces of this should be stuff that you could pick up by uh, limiting what you're searching for. If you dig a little bit deeper, you click on a restaurant, you'll see this. Again, summary statistics about the restaurant, uh, some pictures, and then you could scroll down and you could see uh, text of the different reviews. So this is basically the information we'll be explaining throughout the paper. So what we see is, all right, here are two of the reviews. Uh, the first one was by Dave. Dave is an elite reviewer, has some number of friends and some number of reviews that he's written in the past. And Bryce is not an elite reviewer. So we're going to weight these two reviews differently, and we're going to adjust them based on the types of places that they've been reviewing in the past and what their average rating they've been leaving for places in the past is. OK, and when you dig a little bit deeper, here's what you see. So if you have questions about, oh, what your social profile is, uh, it would look something like this. Uh, so he says, Mr. Smarty Pants bumming around Dallas, and then has uh, actually, so now that you could see the distribution of reviews this person has left, uh, you could see when they were an elite reviewer, uh, and you could also see which of their reviews that they've, that have been voted as useful. So these are all kind of crowdsourced compliments that people get. So Yelp has a social network component of it, so you could see that Dave is friends with uh, 48 other people on Yelp. We don't use this in there, partly because uh, it's not, so one of the reasons that they don't do more with this is that most people when they're using Yelp aren't actually logged in, so it's of limited, so in terms of uh, looking at that as a prescription for how to display information, it's of limited use. Okay, so here's what the basic setup of the model is. Uh, Consider a, a reviewer who's going to write a review for restaurant R uh, time T. So they're going to be the nth reviewer to go to that restaurant. Uh, she observes a signal, SRTN, and uh, also sees all of the reviews, so all of the ratings that came before her. Uh, so X1 through XN. There's some noise in the signal that she sees, so uh, which has variance one over sigma squared. Eventually, we're going to let this variance vary by whether or not you're an elite reviewer. The reviewers all have common knowledge about the signal precision, and they have it down to the level of elite reviewers and non-elite reviewers, because that's the, that's the way in which we're going to be re-aggregating things. Uh, you could do this by any level you think is most useful. Uh, and reviewers are going to use all the past ratings to form an expectation of the true quality of the restaurant by Bayesian updating. So the way to think about this is, well, so, or one question that may come up at this point is, should reviewers be conditioning on all the prior information uh, if it's a case that we're not allowing, or we're thinking of this as a problem to help people who aren't fully updating on the consumer side? And the way that we're thinking about this is just that reviewers are a lot more engaged, so are more likely to be reading through all the reviews uh, relative to everybody else, and also the fact that we're estimating the extent of hurting uh, would just come up as a very low amount of hurting if you think that people aren't actually reading through this. 
And essentially what we're thinking about here, and you could do this a whole bunch of different ways, but we're thinking about people have two possible uh, types of motivation for reviewing a restaurant. We think about the venter, so somebody who just wants to announce their signal and doesn't care about anything else. They don't care about updating, they don't care about helping, they just say, I either like this place or hated this place, and let me just announce that to the world. And uh, then we have the updater. And the updater is somebody who wants to be right about the restaurant quality. And the way we're thinking about this is some sort of a social concern. So uh, one way you might think about this is elite reviewers who want to be part of this community and look like they really know what they're talking about. This is a common type of motivation uh, in online review type platforms and crowdsourced platforms in general. So you can think about somebody who goes on and comments at the bottom of every news article uh, and one person who just wants to say whatever is on their mind and the other person who wants to build on a conversation. In general, uh, these are things where you know, somebody may have less of a reputation or you can think about people who are either kind of validating through Facebook might look very different from people who are leaving anonymous uh, posts below somebody's article. And then what we're having is reviewers who are trying to minimize their disutility from writing a review. And the disutility is gonna essentially put weight on uh, this venter part of themselves and this uh, updating part of themselves. So rho is going to be the amount of weight that they put on on being right. And one minus rho is gonna be the amount of weight that they're putting on uh, their venter selves. So essentially what we have here is here's your rating, here's the signal you get, and here's what we're going to refer to as your stringency. And then once you have that, you can start to say what the optimal review is going to be. So the optimal review is going to minimize uh, this combination of, so one minus row times your, uh, your stringency type plus your signal, uh, plus the amount of weight that you're putting on being an updater times your actual expected value of the quality uh, conditional on everything you've seen in the past. Then we're going to have lambda is going to be uh, the stringency of the reviewer for restaurant R. And uh, just to simplify all the things that we're doing, we're going to have all the reviewers be have this of the same elite status, share the same amount of weight that they're putting on their social concern relative to their venting concern. Okay. So then what we want to do is once we have this, you could say, oh, here's the optimal rating I'm going to leave, conditional on everything I've seen. Uh, we want to start to think about other things that could affect the data generating process. Uh, so the first thing that we wanted to add to this is, well, what if quality is changing over time? So what we do is just assume that quality change is exogenous, and we just allow quality to change as a random walk. Again, we'd be open to other types of versions of this, but this is just something that we, were allowed, that we could separately identify from everything else that's going on in the model. Uh, so every period, so basically the, the way that we're going to be identifying this is over time. So you have some quality at time t minus 1, then you get some shock, and at, qual at time t, uh, you, there's some probability that you've changed your quality. Uh, so it's going to be normally distributed with uh, variance sigma squared. So uh, then what you'll see is just over time that your expected uh, quality is going to be your expected quality from before plus uh, whatever your Kasai is. And the variance of the restaurant quality at time Tn is going to be conditional on uh, Tn minus 1. You could just sum up, you could sum up all of your Kasai's over time. So essentially the underlying identification strategy or our underlying identification assumptions here are going to be that we're going to have some things that are varying across the number of reviews that have been left and some things that are varying over time. So when we want to identify something like a peer effect, we're going to be looking at uh, how you take into account the review that happened before you, whether it happened three days before or whether it happened one day before. And the way that we're going to identify quality changes is we're going to assume that all quality changes are just happening over time. So uh, regardless of when you had your last review, you're equally likely to have a quality change one day ago versus two days ago versus uh, three days ago. And then we're going to have all this reviewer and restaurant heterogeneity. Uh, the heterogeneous social concern is going to look like these two different rows, and we're going to have different precisions, uh, sigma squared, and they're just going to be based on elite versus non-elite. Uh, and then we're going to have these reviewer attribute heterogeneity where it's going to basically just be based on how many reviews you've left in the past uh, and what the frequency of your reviewing behavior is. And finally, when we're thinking about restaurant types, essentially we're just going to do a factor analysis where we say, oh, here are the things we know about restaurants and different people may have different preferences over those things. Okay. Uh, so then what's the data generating process? So these restaurant quality is evolving in this random walk. 
uh, and reviewer observes all the attributes and the reviews of these previous people and obtains their signal uh, and the optimal review is going to take this form. So you have uh, your review is going to be your stringency plus the amount of weight that you're putting on being right uh, plus the signal. Oh yeah, so plus the signal that you get. So you're forming beliefs on everything before you uh, and then kind of putting a little bit more weight on kind of the signal that you get based on how much of a venter you are. Okay. So just to give an, an idea of where all this identification is coming for coming from, uh, the signal, so the variance, so the precision of the reviewers is just coming from the variance of the first review, uh, the the learning, so the amount that you're taking into account the person uh, before you is coming from the autocorrelation between reviews within a restaurant, and then this, so the variance around the quality change of the restaurant is just coming from the calendar day we're not able to fully identify kind of just levels of quality. So we can't say, oh, all restaurants are two stars or all restaurants are four stars. All we could say is that uh, something like elite or non-elite or whatever level at which we're doing this separation, uh, that different types of reviewers have different uh, levels of stringency. So here we are, we're able to say something like uh, elite reviewers are more or less stringent than non-elites. Uh, okay, so just to give a quick data summary, so this is all based on Seattle data. Uh, we've got 18,700 Yelp reviews. It covers about 4,000 restaurants between 2004 and 2010. And at any given time, it's about 1,600 of these are operating. Uh, there's high turnover in here. Uh, the average number of reviews is, 30, is about 33 reviews. The average rating on Yelp is about 3.7 stars. Uh, the average rating is somewhat similar for elite and non-elite reviewers. You could see uh, actually that about something like a third of the content is being produced by elite reviewers, even though elite reviewers don't actually account for that many of the people on there. And this is pretty common. So the number of reviews per reviewer for an elite reviewer is gonna be 25 reviews and about five for a non-elite reviewer. And the frequency of reviews is gonna be a little bit higher, but not that much for an elite reviewer versus non-elite. Uh, just to give an idea of how, uh, how these two populations compare, you can see that there is, this is just the rating of a person versus the rating of a restaurant. Um, so here's a distribution of, so here's the density of this. Essentially what you can see is that uh, on average, elite reviewers are closer to the restaurant mean. And they have a little bit of kind of, uh, so, they're like, you can see that they basically have the same mean, but they're like closer on average. So it's a little bit of like a more packed together distribution of stuff. So this is kind of what a lot of this intuition that uh, they're closer to right would be based on. And here's a chilling effect. So this is the thing that we were talking about with the fact that reviews tend to decline within a restaurant, within a restaurant over time. Uh, basically, these are the residuals for a restaurant just after looking at uh, your fixed effects uh, over the number of reviews that you have. And what you see is that your uh, first review is something like a tenth of a star higher than your 60th review on average. And this is something that happens on Yelp, but again, we're, so I'm leery of calling it just a quality effect because you also see it in things like books where you wouldn't expect quality to actually change over time. And uh, basically when we put all this in, what we see is that elite reviewers have higher precision based on this. Uh, and all, again, all identified from the first review and uh, elite reviewers place higher weight on prior content. So when thinking about how they're weighting prior content versus a non-elite person, you see some variation in there. Okay, so what we do is then run a bunch of counterfactuals to see, does it matter whether you just do a simple, simple average or whether you do kind of some sort of optimal aggregation. And well, the types of things that we wanna check are both kind of some static metrics and also some dynamic metrics. So uh, first we start off by assuming a basic model and that reviews are ID and quality is held fixed. And then you can see that the optimal average is obviously gonna be the same as a simple average. And then we go from there and we say, well, what if people have social concerns? Like how much is that going to change the uh, path of restaurant ratings? And uh, what happens if people have heterogeneous precision? So you wanna be weighting different people differently. How is that going to affect the convergence of ratings? And finally, uh, what if the restaurant quality changes over time and you're just not taking, it into a, a, taking that into account versus R? So the last thing we do in this is we start to just show basically what the difference is in between the simple and optimal average aggregation uh, when you look at the distribution of reviews that are sitting on Yelp's website at kind of like the most recent quarter that we have here. So what we look at here is basically the, the 
95% confidence interval of what ratings are going to look like for a three-star restaurant based on a couple of different assumptions as each additional review gets, as each additional review comes in. So on the left, what we have is just if your uh, row is equal to one, your variance is equal to one. And you can see the optimal, so basically what we see here is the main thing to look at is that the, it converge more quickly if you use the optimal aggregation. So if you take into, effect, into account the fact that people are taking into account things already, uh, then you could get the average rating to converge a lot quicker uh, than if you don't take that into account. Uh, second thing just to look at is, well, what happens if people have different levels of precision? And as soon as you start to do that, you have this dynamic property of different convergence rates. So if you start to weight people who have better information more, uh, what you could see is that you could get uh, quicker convergence. So even if you believe kind of law of large numbers, when you have uh, 10, 20, 30 reviews, you could start to get things that uh, converge a lot more quickly. So here we're kind of doing, here's a simulation where we just have quality change. Um, and basically the main thing to look at when there's quality change is by allowing for some sort of quality change you see updating that happens a lot quicker. Now, of course, none of this really matters too much until you start to see, well, how much does this actually matter if you apply all this to all the data? And uh, the answers here are going to be quite different depending on how you interpret this chilling effect. So if you think of it as this downward trend is all just some sort of selection or uh, chilling effect where the people came earlier, just like it better, uh, even though it's the same quality over time, then essentially what you see is, uh, well, let me just go through the, here, so I don't have it here. So what you see is that 23% of the restaurants would get their, have their simple average that's at least 0.15 stars too low. Uh, and 11% of restaurants are gonna have their simple average that's gonna be uh, at least 0.15 stars too high. So kind of to put this into context, you can think about uh, one star is going to be 5% of sales. So essentially that's at least uh, kind of half a percent of sales difference based on the way that it's being aggregated relative to truth. Now, if you think that the downward trend is actually about quality, then obviously you're gonna see some different patterns in terms of who's overstated versus who's understated. If you think the downward trend's um, actual quality thing, then what you see is that there were actually a bunch of quality changes over time that you've missed by using a simple arithmetic average where these guys have been burning reputation and relying too much on their heavy thing. So then you'll see a bunch of restaurants that you would wanna downgrade because their simple average is looking too high because you're giving equal weight to an early review relative to a late review. So when we think about this, uh, it's a pretty simple model, and you can imagine taking different approaches to this. Uh, but what it gives you is a data generating process to see um, based on reviewer attributes, based on the precision of different types of reviewers, and based on different people's incentives to are heard, uh, you can start to do things like say, well, uh, what's the way information should be aggregated on this type of platform? So I think this idea of kind of comparing it to kind of a purely statistical approach would be kind of an interesting uh, benchmark for this as well. But I think the main thing that I think about here is that aggregation is pretty important if you think about either a static snapshot of how things are looking and also how things are changing over time. In terms of kind of the economic incentives, you could also imagine not just gaming um, in terms of what somebody is going to write as a function of stuff, but how this affects a restaurant's dynamic as the kind of dynamic incentives if they think there's some possibility of burning a reputation. Uh, so kind of to say, say something more broadly about this area, for me at least, kind of this idea of designing information is pretty exciting, but as you can see here, it has a whole bunch of challenges that I think are only partially thought through within the literature. Even in a really simple setting, so it's not just such as aggregating a single metric of vertical quality, uh, there's a whole bunch of issues here. Uh, it's ripe for economic intervention. So I think there are a bunch of things that we could do, uh, both in kind of uh, Yelp type context, but in any information or disclosure type context, uh, where that is going to touch on a bunch of different disciplines. So I think kind of in this world, it's stuff that's relying both on economics, but also on some of the CS literature, on, and also on a lot of social psychology on how people are actually leaving these reviews. All right, thank you.